Toko Kumamoto from UNITAR, and we will be right back. Please stay tuned. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Today we have Mihoko Kumamoto from UNITAR, and we are going to be talking about sustainable development and a lot of the wonderful workshops that they offer through the Hiroshima UNITAR office. Thank you so much for joining, Mihoko. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time. I've wanted you on the show, and today is the 60th episode so a very special episode thank you so much thank you thank you so much for having me once again for this special day special episode yeah. um so uh, should i introduce myself yes please if you wouldn't okay. mind okay okay great so hi everyone my name is mihoko kumamoto i am director of unita hiroshima office uh, so unita is united nations institute for training and research there are many UN agencies. Uh, there are about 30, 40 UN agencies. But UNITA, uh, we offer training uh, and the learning opportunities for people around the world. Uh, just quickly about myself, uh, I am originally from Fukuoka, Japan, uh, which is the southern part of Japan, not so far from Hiroshima. Um, and um, I grew up in Japan, but at the age of 18, I left Japan. I studied in the U.S. for university, uh, and then I came back to Japan, worked in the private sector in Japan for six years. And then again, I left Japan. I studied in the U.S. for master's degree, and in 2008, one, I joined the United Nations. So I've been in the UN system for almost 20 years. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Time really uh, flew. Yeah. I worked in multiple countries. Uh, that was wonderful. I worked in Vietnam, uh, Samoa, Indonesia, and Hiroshima I came about seven years ago. Yeah, you did your master's in economic development from Columbia University, right? That's correct, yes, in New York. And then you have worked all over the world, really, and done projects around the world. Um, you did an interesting project with the island nations on crisis prevention and recovery, it sounds like. And Jakarta, Indonesia, you said, and Samoa, Cook Islands. So you really um, have a deep knowledge of the Asia area and the kinds of problems and solutions for this area, right? That's correct. That's correct. Yes. My first assignment uh, with the UN was in Vietnam. And then I had a chance to move to Samoa, working for various Pacific Island countries. Um, very, very interesting place. Beautiful. Um, green, uh, beautiful ocean. I truly enjoyed my life there, uh, but those countries have their own issues, uh, including natural, frequent natural disasters, such as cyclones um, and tsunami. Uh, so we uh, were working for those uh, issues. Um, and then uh, now here in Hiroshima, uh, working for, uh, we work for Asian countries, uh, Pacific Island countries, uh, and actually, we are working a lot for Middle Eastern countries and also African countries. So uh, we have been very busy. Yeah, for sure. And uh, now on the screen, I'm showing you have freed and paid online courses, Hiroshima and Peace courses, Frontier Technologies, and Anti-Corruption and Combating Crime. So on the uh, UNITAR website, you can see a lot of the workshops and seminars and courses that you guys run. Um, can you introduce some of them a little bit? Right, right. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, every year we run about 10 to 15 different training programs. Uh, most of the programs are for developing countries, uh, including conflict and post-conflict countries. Um, for example, Afghanistan, Iraq and South Sudan, we have been working for their people for a long time. Um, some, uh, let's see, uh, for example, we have uh, been uh, running this uh, training program on entrepreneurship, uh, social entrepreneurship for uh, Iraq. 
since 2016. The idea is that, um, you know, uh, many countries, including Iraq, uh, they are facing so many issues uh, for many reasons, uh, including conflict uh, and violence. Um, and of course, uh, they have the, the government, uh, public services, but uh, often um, their services are not sufficient um, and the people living there are not uh, having access to, for example, hospitals or, you know, enough food uh, or water access. There are so many issues. Uh, so to address those issues, uh, one way is for people, not just uh, waiting for government to come and help, but people can come up with their own ideas and design, start, uh, think about uh, actual, like how to address those problems by themselves, start a new company uh, and start addressing those issues. So it's entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. So uh, uh, we have been training young people in Iraq, particularly women, uh, regarding how to start up a new business so mm -hmm. that they can address their own problems. Wonderful. It's a very exciting project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading articles about how if you give small business loans to women in many of the developing countries, that it helps the community so much and they can start their own small entrepreneurships, like you said, um, and then it supports the children and it supports the local community in, in so many interesting ways. So what rewarding work you guys are doing from the UNITAR office. Uh, just to track back a little bit, the UNITAR office in Hiroshima, right now on screen I'm showing, we have the A-bomb dome uh, ruins right in Peace Park, and then right behind the A-bomb dome is your office, the black building behind. Can you talk a little bit about the location of the office and how that helps you with your training and work? Mm -mm, right, yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, our office was started in 2003 um, and uh, before that Hiroshima had no UN agencies. Um, and Hiroshima, in, uh, Hiroshima approached UNITA uh, to, to find if we'll be interested in having an office in Hiroshima. And we thought about it, and it made a lot of sense for us, uh, because considering the history of Hiroshima, it uh, used to be a center of military operations, but now transformed into a city of peace. Um, so uh, we established UNITA office in 2003, and uh, Joyce, as you said, our office is in front of the atomic bomb dome, and it's, uh, it's, we are very, very lucky to have this location because we have people, of course, it's, I'm talking about pre-COVID time, um, we, reg we used to have visitors from different places around the world, particularly people coming from uh, difficult uh, countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, South Sudan. Uh, still, uh, they are uh, suffering from conflict and you know, uh, violence on a day-to-day -day basis. And they come to Hiroshima, they look at atomic bomb dome, uh, they go to the museum, and see how Hiroshima used to look like before atomic bomb dome, after, immediately after atomic bomb dome, and they see how it looks like now. And they, they really truly get encouraged. They see hope. And this is really, really important because what I find is that um, people from these uh, countries, they are current or future leaders, they are still young. They are in 20s or 30s, sometimes 40s. Um, and uh, throughout their lifetime, they have been in conflict all the time. Um, and they often do not really know what their city should look like uh, because they, in, they have been fighting conflict uh, and violence all the time. And they look at Hiroshima and they see one model of how they should transform their city to a peaceful city. Um, some people 
see uh, atomic bomb dome from our office window, they they really they uh, they sometimes some people uh, really tear up. Um, so it's uh, it's really it's it's really powerful to be in Hiroshima. Yeah, what a, a powerful location. And especially if you're doing conflict negotiation, you have people who uh, usually cannot agree or negotiate, and they look out on the A-bomb dome, and it's a powerful image of this is what might happen if we don't find ways to negotiate or agree, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. It's... Um... It's really, it's it's really challenging. Um, of course, um, you know the Hiroshima, the situation of Hiroshima back in 1945 during World War II, is different from the situation where many countries are going through right now. You know, such as Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, those countries uh, right now, they are it's it's civil war. Often they, there is fighting within their country. Uh, on the other hand, during World War II, it was more fighting between countries. Uh, so there are many, many different uh, elements. Uh, having said that, um, you know, it's uh, people come to Hiroshima and people see uh, what happened. So it really drives home this, you know, this clear message, you know, fighting destruction is it's going to bring uh, nothing but pain um, to everyone. So uh, it's important. Uh, Hiroshima has a very important message to the rest of the world. That's great. I, I mean, <laughs> that's powerful. Um, but I think one of the things that people who normally just visit Peace Park or the museum, and then afterwards they feel like, what can I do? You know, but in your position, bringing people there to do negotiation after visiting Peace Park and the museum, they know what they can do. So there's uh, action. There is a positive and proactive response to the visit to Peace Park that people who are working with your team can do. And I, I think that it's such a, a beautiful way to use the legacy of, of Hiroshima in a positive and proactive way. Mm -mm -mm. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, um, it's, it's challenging. Um, you know, what we do is we train people uh, and we focus particularly on future leaders, so young people. Uh, in their 20s or their 30s. And like, for example, our training program on nuclear disarmament and non-preparation, we bring young professionals from Asian countries uh, and give them um, knowledge and skills um, necessary for negotiations. It's a tough negotiation. Um, so they can, they can do better uh, and uh, make good progress. Um, having said that, uh, you know, uh, current negotiations, uh, not only nuclear negotiations, uh, but many negotiations are very complex. Uh, and uh, there are issues not only with individuals, but uh, for with systems. Uh, because, you know, when people go to a negotiation, they are representing their country not representing themselves alone. So they, they have to consider so many different elements. But what we are really hoping to achieve is um, through our the, uh, you know, learning, they, they understand uh, what other countries are uh, thinking, their positions, different views, uh, so that they understand uh, they will be able to see issues from different perspectives, not only from their own, their own, their country's perspectives, but understand different positions, so that they can uh, make educated, informed decisions. Because at the end of the day, everyone wants to create a better world for ourselves and also for future generations. Um, so we are trying our best. You're doing great work. Wonderful. Thank you. Very valuable. Um, what kinds of activities do you do? I'm showing now the workshop 
pictures, um, people putting uh, posters together, having discussions. Um, what kind of activities? Can you walk us through some of the, the aims or the type of activities? Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are um, we implement various types of training programs. Uh, we are very busy, um, but we focus mainly on six uh, thematic areas. Uh, number one is uh, peace and any other issues related to Hiroshima. Uh, so, for instance, um, this uh, new, uh, training on nuclear disarmament and non-preparation, this falls into this thematic area. And the second thematic, the second topic is entrepreneurship. Uh, so uh, the training program I just explained before about Iraq is for this area. And uh, we uh, train uh, this uh, topic for other countries, including Syria. Uh, we are starting another entrepreneurship uh, project for countries in the Horn of Africa. So Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, and Kenya. So uh, it's quickly expanding. And the third area is trade and finance. Uh, because uh, this one, it's not, uh, I don't want to make the story too complicated, but I, anyway, we work closely with our team in Geneva because our headquarters are in Geneva. Uh, so uh, working with them, we implement uh, financial training of financial inclusion uh, uh, and uh, microfinance for African Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and we also have anti-corruption training program. This is for uh, countries in the Sahel region. And it's a, it's a Francophone uh, training program. And we have also a training uh, using digital technologies. So uh, the project uh, you introduced briefly, Joy, um, this uh, AI project uh, for social entrepreneurship for women in Iraq and Afghanistan was for this thematic area. Uh, and we also have the last thematic area is uh, leadership and, the, and empowerment. This one, uh, we, um, we train people for, um, uh, for uh, people who have been marginalized uh, to empower them. Like, for example, we have a training program for Afghanistan women's leadership. Um, Afghanistan, um, unfortunately, has been in, uh, in conflict, uh, has been suffering from various issues for such a long time. And particularly women, uh, they, uh, they bear the brunt of uh, violence and conflict. So, but they are actually very, very, uh, as many of, uh, many of the, the listeners probably know, women um, in any countries around the world, including Afghanistan, they are very dedicated and they are very talented. So uh, we, uh, we bring together women, uh, future leaders, um, and we uh, train gender issues, um, what, what they are, and also give skill sets so that they can uh, they can demonstrate leadership and uh, start uh, becoming active participants in decision making at the community level. Um, so it's a very very exciting uh, thematic area. But anyway, we work in these six main thematic areas. Yeah, it's amazing and such rewarding work. And I'm sure you've seen so many examples of people who take part in the program and then you see what they're doing back in their home country and how rewarding and exciting that must be. Uh, indeed, it is um, very, very, uh, very, very rewarding. Um, and in, like, for example, one participant we had uh, from Afghanistan uh, for our AI project, um, we recently had an interview uh, with her uh, and uh, uh, to find out what she, how she's doing after going through our training program. And it was really, we were really excited to find that uh, after the training program, 
on social entrepreneurship using AI, she uh, started, uh, she, she developed a business plan and she has been talking with different uh, financial supporters uh, and she is uh, really getting ready to start a new company. Um, so it's very, very exciting. That's awesome. I was talking with Sarah Jean Rosito the other day. She's a social entrepreneurship trainer and she does a lot of uh, work with NGOs and MPOs around the world as well as in Japan. And of course, similar to your case, this is a huge problem, the coronavirus. You cannot bring people in because of visa restrictions, but also because of safety, you can't bring people in. Um, and she was mentioning that even online workshops is quite difficult because a lot of the people uh, around the world do not have the internet connection to be able to do online activities. Have you found the same, same kind of hurdles? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. For some countries, um, such as Kenya and Ethiopia, Kenya, Ethiopia is more challenging actually. Uh, they have relatively stable internet connectivity, uh, so it's okay. Uh, it's okay to shift to online courses. Uh, however, some countries, um, for example, South Sudan. South Sudan is uh, one of the most challenging countries that I have ever worked for. Uh, their infrastructure, infrastructure is very limited. Uh, the airport, for example, uh, very, very small um, and like lots of, um, lots of issues. Internet connection is, of course, it's uh, extremely limited. Um, not many people have computers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we are, but um, we are trying to shift all our learning activities to online for 2020 and early 2021. And uh, luckily, we have been able to do so for majority of countries. Uh, South Sudan, we haven't been able to do it yet uh, because of internet connection issue and also security issues. Um, because uh, they they have, uh, you know, for for um, South Sudan and many other countries, it's not just a pandemic that they are fighting, but they are uh, they are fighting with many other issues, uh, security issue, uh, moving from one place to another. Uh, always involves some risks. Um, and also there are other types of disease, uh, malaria, dengue. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's very complex. Um, but anyway, so for South Sudan, uh, we are still trying to, trying to figure it out. Hopefully we can find a good solution. We'll see. Yeah, good luck. I hope um, there's, there's some innovation, maybe using existing technology like telephones. I heard smartphones are actually more common in use than computers in many developing countries. Um, maybe developing more apps so you don't have to be online when you are doing the workshop or, or online sessions. I, I think there, there are answers here, but we need a variety of stakeholders to give their input and, and advice for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as you said, it's a, this corona uh, virus, this pandemic has um, posed lots of challenges, but uh, it's uh, but on the other hand, it's really accelerating innovation, particularly using digital technology. So you know, Joy, as you said, uh, micro learning, it's uh, you know, using mobile phone uh, is becoming has become very popular. Uh, chunk learning, so you know, very different from traditional learning. Traditional learning, people go to a classroom and sit for one hour, listen. Uh, but uh, with mobile-based uh, learning, people uh, take short courses, maybe five minutes, ten minutes, wherever they want, at home or when they are outside. So it's chunk learning. Uh, and very interactive. It's not just uh, reading, reading, but uh, there is also a discussion space, so interactive. It's very exciting. Uh, 
but at the same time, one thing I found is that uh, it's also, uh, you know, uh, not just digital technology, but uh, it'll be useful thing to think of other technologies as well. Uh, for example, in coming back to South Sudan, so in South Sudan, people rely on radio the most uh, because TV is not so common yet. Internet getting there, but not there, but still rare. Uh, so, but radio, it's everywhere, um, and people people listen. Um, so uh, now uh, it would be it would be important. I think it would be uh, good uh, to think about uh, using radio uh, to uh, to promote learning in a country like South Sudan. So. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it'll be good, interesting uh, and effective to think of using new technologies, but also think back what we what technology we used to use and try various methodologies and modalities uh, to to meet the local situation the best. That's awesome. I, I think um, I always think of the movie The Martian. When, when, you know, like this is someone who's who's in a high tech environment, but the high tech's not working. So he has to think back to his biology training from high school and figure out how to survive. It's like, I mean, that's an extreme example, but um, we kind of have to think, what did we use before, you know, and what do they have? And how can we use that again in a new way that's useful to them? I love the idea of chunk learning, the short lessons. Um, in, in my case, when I was doing online master's classes and everything, that type of learning really resonates with me. And I can take that little chunk of information and think about it all day and then go back to it and you know write essays and stuff. So I, I think it could be very effective. Yes, I think so. Um, people really like it. Uh, we get positive feedback from our participants. I also try myself, uh, and I really like it because I think every not nowadays people have such a busy life, um, juggling so many things in the personal life and the work life. Uh, so uh, this chunk the learning five minute, ten minute every uh, whenever you can. Uh, suits me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, so uh, positive feedback. That's great. On the UNITAR website, um, let, let's shift a little bit to the SDGs and kind of the mission of UNITAR in general. Uh, it says UNITAR supports governments to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to solve complex global challenges. We transform mindsets by offering learning, analytical, and capacity-centered solutions for a more sustainable world. Um, would you introduce that a bit to us? Mm -mm -mm. Right, right. Um, so, uh, yeah, firstly about the Agenda 2030, it's, uh, it's also called the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the listeners uh, or viewers uh, are aware of the SDGs. It's a, it's a global, it's a, it's a framework, it's a vision um, about ideal world, um, which right now, uh, the current uh, world we live in, it has many, many issues uh, and everyone is highly aware. Um, it's, um, for example, environmental issues, uh, climate, climate change, and also deforestation, water issue, pollution. Uh, so uh, there are many, we are facing many environmental issues. Uh, we are also facing many socio-economic issues like poverty. We are, the world is making good progress, um, but still so many people stay in extreme poverty. And unfortunately, COVID, the pandemic, is creating lots of pressure. So many people who got lifted out of poverty are expected to go back to poverty, unfortunately. Um, and then, uh, also, gender issue. Uh, we talked a little bit. Um, women, uh, many women around the world have not given uh, sufficient opportunities, equal opportunities 
uh, to uh, to uh, unlock their potential, and also inequality issue. This is uh, this is really truly a major issue in the world. Um, so uh, right currently, the world faces so many issues. So uh, this uh, SDG Sustainable Development Goals uh, has 17 goals. Uh, and by 2030, uh, uh, UN member states, including Japan, um, US, uh, or many all the countries uh, who have joined the UN, are expected to make efforts to achieve these uh, 17 SDG goals. Um, so uh, that's uh, where we are now. We are now 2020. So that means that uh, one third, uh, sorry, the SDGs were designed in uh, 2015 and expected to achieve in 2030. So five years have passed already. We have 10 more years to achieve. Now, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, number one person, uh, he uh, just released the latest progress report uh, for uh, the Agenda 2030. Unfortunately, um, because of the pandemic, lots of progress made towards the SDGs have been reversed. Um, so that's a, that's a really important message for all of us. Um, it is really, really important to join efforts, uh, to work together. Uh, to make progress to accelerate these uh, SDGs. Um, so um, I'm talking a lot. So let me stop no, here. No, no, that's that's good. Um, when I when I do consulting and I talk to businesses about SDGs, I just mention it because for Japan, like many countries, SDGs is part of the goals. But when it comes to the practicality of how do we Im implement. SDG positive proactive change in our existing systems, that's where the hurdle is. And I do, you must see that a lot too, right? Like how these are great uh, ideas. How do we get it to work? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, I go to many schools, uh, elementary school, junior high school, and high schools in Hiroshima, and the students ask the same question. So they, we talk about the SDGs and they say, okay, uh, I understand the importance, then what can we do? Um, and also some students ask, uh, Japan is an advanced society already, so uh, should we really have to worry about the SDGs? Um, and, um, you know, the thing is that uh, the SDGs, um, even for developed countries, um, no, no society, no country is perfect. Uh, for example, Japan, um, there are issues, um, including gender um, and uh, also inequality. Um, so uh, there are... Uh, many issues to be addressed. Um, and for young people, particularly, you know, including students, uh, these SDGs are really for them because uh, when uh, 2030 comes, they are in their 20s or 30s, and they are the one who are really driving uh, or shaping uh, their society, their country. Um, now, what can they do? You know, uh, I always say, you know, sky is the limit. Uh, of course, you know, there are many ongoing initiatives uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the first step they should, uh, they should do is to join uh, ongoing initiatives uh, and learn uh, what they are doing and learn from uh, and learn from them. But um, the... Again, the current uh, system is not perfect. Uh, so we're going to have to think of new ways to address issues, innovative ways. So uh, after gaining, uh, gaining knowledge and experience from existing uh, activities, what I'm really hoping uh, for young people to do is they think creatively 
and they think of their own uh, their plan uh, by themselves they, and they start new initiatives uh, by themselves uh, first will be fine and then gradually engage friends, family members and communities. And uh, that's, uh, that's how this, uh, you know, this, uh, this girl, Greta, from Sweden started um, for climate action uh, in Sweden. Uh, she was by herself uh, and doing uh, lots of activities. And she started engaging people around her. And look what she has achieved. It's now a global initiative movement. So uh, that's uh, yeah, that's so what inspiring, I really hope. right? Yeah, mm, yeah, absolutely. I I always ask people to do a personal audit, and a few of my speakers in the series have talked about doing a family audit or a personal audit, where you look at your consumption habits, you look at what you use every day. And you try to make parallels between what you're doing, what you're buying, what you have around you, and the SDGs. And thinking about, if I change this, what part of the SDGs does that help? If, if I take part in this challenge or this activity, like for example, July is Plastic Free July, um, how can that help the SDGs? Oh, wow, it's more than one. You know, so it's it's making that connection between what your life actually uses and what you actually do in your life with the SDGs. And I would hope the businesses that have the SDG pin on are trying that at the company, are thinking about, uh, should we get rid of pet bottles and have a reusable water bottle dispenser? Um, should we have reusable coffee cups instead of disposable coffee cups? Um, should we use recycled paper at the printer? I mean, there's every company, every house has little things that you can think about and make a change if possible, you know? I, I know there's uh, cost considerations, right? Like, oh, that's gonna cost more to shift, but at least thinking about it, at least trying it. And if it doesn't work, then you think about it again later, you know, but practical steps, right? Tangible steps. I think one of the frustrations many people have with SDGs is it seems intangible. Like it's, it's a nice idea, right? Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think what you said is a great idea. I think, that, you know, um, and this is something that the UN has to be careful because uh, UN people, including myself, tends to use lots of jargons. Uh, and as you said, you know, concept, <laughs> not really concrete actions. Uh, so uh, that's something I have to be careful about. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think um, what is important is, uh, as I said, to become aware of each action we take, uh, because uh, it starts for, with every one of us. Um, and the little change we make um, using a different product that is more environmentally friendly, or that considers uh, human rights issues, uh, like for example, child labor, it's a major problem. Uh, human trafficking is, is a real issue. Uh, so uh, making sure whatever you are buying uh, or whatever you, know, whatever you do, you pay attention that uh, you are not contributing to, uh, to promoting those issues. And then uh, you uh, you do that constantly, and that uh, over time will accumulate and will make significant impact. And if many of us, and eventually every one of us, do that, then uh, we can truly achieve the SDGs. I'm sure we can do it. Yeah, it's it's just making uh, assessments of your situation taking in knowledge, making an aim or goal that is within a year or something, what are we going to achieve by this time, assessing the goal, 
reevaluating. Like it's it's not a done deal, right? You can't do it just once and that's good. It's an ongoing process, and I think that's challenging, right, for businesses that really only change policy once a year, you know. To but add that to your policy decision time once a year, and that that would make a big, big effect. Uh, let's talk a bit about the workshops that you guys are doing. There's so many amazing workshops available through the main U.S. headquarters website, as well as. Um, Unitar Hiroshima website. Um, for example, there's International Law in Focus, uh, Law of the Sea starting in September, and all of these uh, courses I'm mentioning are web-based now because of coronavirus or traveling restrictions. Um, what's another one? There's so many interesting ones. Negotiation of financial transactions. So it says Ag Fund eCourse. Does that mean it's for farmers, like agriculture? They are not for uh, for farmers, uh, but they are uh, mainly for people working for microfinance uh, organizations. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, also, United Nations Young Leaders Online Training Program. Yep, absolutely. Yep, we have uh, many, many, many online courses. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, please uh, go to the website and uh, look at those courses. There are, there are many. Some are short, some are just one hour, uh, but some are long uh, for six months. Uh, we also have master's degrees. And that's uh, that's long term, um, and each course is for different uh, different people. Uh, some are for students, uh, university students, and some are for professionals uh, who are working uh, and they they work. But when they have time off, they go to the website uh, online platform and take courses. So there are many different uh, courses. So um, please pick. Uh, what is suitable for your situation, for your case, and then take uh, take and learn. Nice. And some of them are certificate courses. Some of them are diploma courses. Like you mentioned, some are higher degree courses. Of course, the length of time is different. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the fees? Like how much do they cost? Or Right. Um, some courses are free. Um, for example, we are launching uh, a course uh, for uh, students, high school students based in Hiroshima. It's called Youth Ambassador Training uh, Program. Uh, that's free. Um, and also Act Fund training courses you just mentioned. That's also uh, free. Uh, those courses, free courses, are uh, they are free because we have donors, supporters. Uh, and uh, we train people for people who usually do not have opportunities. Uh, so uh, people based in developing countries or uh, youth, young people. Uh, so uh, you find lots of uh, free training uh, programs. Some courses are uh, uh, so-called fee-based. Uh, so uh, everyone uh, has to pay a course, uh, uh, course fee. Uh, the price ranges uh, depending on the duration and also content. Um, so uh, it, it really varies. Um, so uh, uh, please go to the website uh, and then uh, you, you see the different, uh, you know, price, price setting, price setting. Yeah, there's so many interesting courses. Some of, since my focus is on sustainability, some of them that struck me, uh, stood out to me. Um, the Masters of Disaster Resilience and Sustainable Development sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. That's a course uh, organized by our colleagues based in Geneva. Um, and uh, it's not run by UNITA Hiroshima office, uh, but uh, our colleagues in Geneva, also in New York, uh, also organize uh, many different courses. Um, we have three locations. Um, one is New York, one is Geneva, and one is Hiroshima. We actually have a small office in Nigeria as well. 
uh, each office uh, is responsible for uh, different thematic areas. For example, New York team, uh, because New York is center of multilateral diplomacy. So uh, they have lots of diplomacy training courses. Uh, Geneva team, they uh, often cover peace issues, uh, also environmental issues, uh, including climate change. Uh, we also have courses on satellite image and analysis training. Um, and uh, Hiroshima office, we cover uh, peace issue and also um, trade, finance, economic issues as well. So very diverse thematic areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. Um, tell me a bit about the staff at the Hiroshima office. Right. Uh, yeah, we have a very uh, dynamic team. Uh, right now, we have about 20 people working for the Hiroshima uh, office. Uh, and they are based uh, across the world, actually. Uh, so. Uh, it's a Hiroshima office team, but uh, team members are sitting, but some, are, some people are based in Hiroshima, including myself, but some people are one person in New Zealand, uh, and we have one person, Afghanistan, Kabul, and also Baghdad, uh, Juba, South Sudan, and also in the US as well. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a global network. And thanks to technology, um, and we are luckily Unita office is quite advanced uh, in terms of uh, telecommuting even before COVID. Uh, so it doesn't really matter where you are based, uh, as far as you have internet connection, um, you can join uh, Unita Hiroshima office team. So uh, it's a very exciting environment. That's great. You have volunteer staff as well as paid staff. Is that right? Right, right, yes. Uh, so we have uh, volunteer interns, uh, so often uh, graduate students, uh, and um, they are, you know, they are really um, passionate uh, to work for various global complex issues. Um, so uh, they, they come join. Uh, we also, uh, last year, we joined uh, this uh, NPO, non-profit organization, to work with UNITA closely. It's called the UNITA Association. Uh, and uh, we are working with uh, various community-based organizations or private companies through the UNITA Association. And with this we have lots of volunteer people working with us. So um, it's exciting to see the group of people growing uh, and who share the same, you know, same dream uh, to, make, uh, to make the world a better place and safe place for everyone. That's wonderful. And the focus of the UNITAR office in Hiroshima is actually not on Japan mostly, right? your focus is on the Asia region. Is, it, is that right? Right, uh, yes. Uh, initially, it was for the Hiroshima office started uh, for as Asia, uh, a regional office for Asia and the Pacific. However, over time, uh, our function evolved. And now uh, we are, uh, we are, our focus is more on thematic areas, so peace uh, and also economic issues. And we work at this point, our, uh, most of our clients come from developing countries in Africa and the Middle East and Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we, uh, right now we don't have any clients in Latin American countries. But uh, we are now working together to, to start doing something for Latin American countries as well. So uh, hopefully in the near future, uh, we will be able to reach out to people around the world. Yeah, wonderful. And it's not just online uh, workshops or seminars that you do. Can you talk a little bit about the other types of work that you do? Right, right. Uh, well, Right now, I'm talking about um, pre-COVID time. Um, before the pandemic, uh, many of our learning activities were actually face-to-face. -face. So uh, we bring people to, for example, Hiroshima, 
uh, and then we organize a workshop uh, or uh, we bring people to Uganda uh, to uh, to talk about uh, peace issues. Uh, so face to face, we used to organize a lot, but uh, because of the current situation, uh, and I, I believe that many of many of us, uh, many organizations are have shifted to online. So all our activities are uh, right now uh, 90 to 95 percent online courses. Mm-hmm. And you also host seminars and speakers, right? Right, right, right. Yes. Uh, so uh, we organize uh, webinars. Uh, right now, it's uh, it's usually one hour to like sixty to ninety minute uh, webinar, and we buy, we invite experts uh, on a specific thematic area, and uh, we have an opportunity to listen to uh, listen from them what's going on in this thematic area, uh, learn, and also have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, the, the, for example, the next one, which is coming up, uh, we haven't announced yet, but we hope to be able to make an official announcement in a few days. It's a, it's a webinar uh, on August 6th, uh, and it's going to be from 6 p.m. Japan time uh, to talk about uh, the current challenges and opportunities surrounding nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, it's going to be in English uh, with simultaneous translation into Japanese. Um, and this year is a very special year for Hiroshima. Uh, this year marks the 75th anniversary of atomic bombing. Uh, originally, uh, the idea was to organize many events, big ceremony in Hiroshima and Antonio Guterres, uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, was expected to visit Hiroshima as well. Unfortunately, oh, wow. yeah, because of the pandemic, and uh, he uh, he could not come. He cannot come. Uh, but uh, Under Secretary General, who is a Japanese lady, uh, Izumi Nakamitsu, is coming. So uh, for our webinar, we will have uh, three speakers. Uh, Izumi, uh, UN Undersecretary General. Uh, we also have Tariq Ralph. Uh, he is an, a global uh, expert in this topic. Uh, he's, he's very knowledgeable, he's fantastic. And we will also have uh, Victoria. Um, she is uh, she's originally from Germany, um, uh, uh, but she's currently based in Hiroshima working uh, for a local NGO and providing various supports for survivors, uh, translation. She's currently translating a book about atomic bombing into German, uh, and also uh, teaching uh, peace-related lessons uh, to children. And uh, so uh, young, uh, young people, future leader. So we are going to have these three speakers and listen from them what's happening, uh, challenges at the global level, and also challenges uh, in Hiroshima, uh, and then uh, explore creative ways forward. So uh, it's August 6, 6 p.m. Japan time. We will make an, annu- an announcement on our Facebook very soon. Wonderful. Yeah, so people can look at the Unitar Hiroshima Facebook page, as well as you have your own Unitar Mihoko Kumamoto Facebook page as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And you can see updated information and links to the website and online workshops, um, online seminars, webinars, and other information. Um, Mm -hmm. On the UNITAR Hiroshima website right now, uh, you are talking about global initiative of ED app and UNITAR. Mm -hmm, Do mm -hmm. you want to introduce that a little bit? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, so uh, we have uh, started a very exciting uh, cooperation partnership with this uh, company called ED app. Uh, it's an Australian company, and they created this uh, learning uh, platform, uh, micro learning. So uh, just uh, 
as I was explaining before, it's a, it's a, you use your smartphone. It's a, 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 so a smartphone-based learning platform. It's chunked learning, uh, and you can learn any, anywhere you want. Um, so uh, um, for our online courses, we are using their platform. And with EdUp, we recently uh, launched this initiative called Educate for Educate All Initiative. Uh, if you go to this uh, site, uh, you, will, you will have access to various free uh, learning courses. Uh, and these uh, learning materials come from, came from many different organizations. Uh, UNITA uh, donated some content, uh, but many other organizations, uh, private companies, uh, non-governmental organizations, they donated their own content. Uh, so uh, um, the, the web link uh, is available on uh, our website, UNITA website, uh, Hiroshima website. So please visit and please check uh, Educate All website initiative. It's very, very exciting. Um, and please take advantage and learn new, new uh, topics. Yeah, fantastic. And it's so wonderful when new technology comes out of challenges like coronavirus, right? Like maybe this is pushing forward faster, like you said, because of the challenges we face with not being able to have face-to-face -face meetings and usual gatherings, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. I really feel that, uh, you know, this uh, pandemic uh, is causing such hardship for everyone across the world. Japan, uh, European countries, uh, Africa, uh, ev everyone. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, we were talking about technologies. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's great and it's, you know, um, even in this very challenging time for everyone, um, some great things are coming out, uh, including, you know, that, for example, this uh, really uh, micro learning uh, using, uh, you know, innovative online platform. Very, very exciting. Uh, simultaneously, I think what we have to remember is not everyone is has been able to tap into, you know, uh, digital technologies. And there are people who have been left behind. Uh, and I often think of people uh, in, uh, you know, Afghanistan or South Sudan or Iraq, uh, where many people still do not have access to, you know, this uh, great innovation of the modern society, you know, Internet. Uh, and so uh, the gaps between uh, people who have access and who don't uh, are widening, unfortunately. So uh, how to help them? That's something we really have to think about. Yeah, I think um, for UNITAR, the, you guys are doing so many different projects on so many different levels to try to address so many different uh, inequalities and issues of diversity and gender empowerment and training and financial sector. How do you do it? How do you keep everything in perspective you don't want to prioritize one thing over another i mean that must be a, a real challenge as a director of so many spinning plates so to speak <laughs> right 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 yeah it's a uh, it's really challenging um still trying to figure out the best uh mixture uh, but the bottom line is we do training based on, uh, on uh, needs uh, coming from uh, clients. So, uh, for example, we are just uh, developing a new project on uh, gender equality and empowerment of women. And it's also a broad uh, topic. There are many issues uh, within uh, this gender uh, issue. Uh, but what we do is we talk with our clients and find out what they want. And based on that need, we design our training. So in a way, it's it's simple because we, we prepare what clients want. Uh, so, uh, yes. <laughs> Very challenging to address so many diverse topics at the same time, right? Mm, um, yeah. We often talk about uh, a lot of social entrepreneurs are uh, narrow and deep, 
right? A very narrow topic and they understand it and address it really deeply. But would you say that your position is more like uh, wide and <laughs> and far reaching? There, there, you can't be narrow in your focus, right? You kind of have to be thinking of the different knock-on effects in different categories. Uh, mm -hmm. How, on a practical level, I can't even imagine how you do it. Is it in your office? Do you have certain uh, specialists who only focus on certain areas? Right, right, yes. Uh, so uh, we are a small team. We have uh, only 20 people, um, but everyone works uh, in a specific area. Although, again, we are, because we are a small team, everyone has multiple hats. So one colleague is responsible for gender equality, empowerment, leadership topic. But the same person is also is responsible for uh, adult learning methodologies. Uh, so we wear multiple hats. My role, uh, you know, like uh, uh, how I see myself is I'm, I'm trying my best to be the captain of a ship in an uncharted world. Uh, <laughs> now, now with this pandemic, you know, the world has turned upside upside down. Uh, so so much unpredictability uh, and uh, so many unknown elements. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is I, I try to step back, try to look at overall issues. Uh, sometimes well, when needed, I'll zoom in and then try to address one topic, but then always try to zoom out and try to to continue, try to have a broad view and find out if some storm is coming. <laughs> I, my responsibility to identify in advance as early as possible and change the course. Um, so uh, that's how I see myself. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's, it's not it's easy. It's challenging. I, mm -hmm. I, when I talk to Kyle, who runs a permaculture center in uh, Okayama, he was saying when they first started the first few years, it was just every problem was an emergency. So you're just dealing with emergencies one after another. But now that things have settled, he can kind of look back at the bigger picture and think, okay, let's prioritize this or, or that. It, which, which do you feel? Do you feel like you're just dealing with emergencies or can you prioritize certain things what's what's your role right um it's a, it's a very interesting question right now before the COVID, i was feeling more the latter so i was able to prioritize you know like um step back and say okay let's focus on this da, 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 more or less under control but with uh, the pandemic uh so so many things have changed um, and, um, you know, our clients, uh, they are having so many issues and we have to be so innovative. We also have to be uh, quick. We can't really take much time to think uh, through and then, OK, we'll provide support one year later. No, we can't afford that. So uh, I feel as if we were in the middle of a storm still. <laughs> Uh, firefighting right now, yeah. uh, but I'm trying not to get caught too much in the short-term uh, perspectives, uh, but plan uh, long-term, like two, like three years down the, the road at least. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to do, but very important from your director point of view. It sounds like it might be, since you're dealing with so many problems right now, it might be hard for you to balance work and life. Are you able to stop work and take a break? I mean, that's really important as a director too, right? Uh, right, right, yeah. I mean, uh, I, yeah, this is something I need to be careful with because uh, uh, in principle, I, I can easily be a workaholic. I don't mind working all the time. 
<laughs> but I am also mother, uh, so uh, I need to end my my daughter. She's still young. She's uh, becoming eight soon, and she needs support. She needs guidance from、uh, parents. My husband is doing a fantastic job, but I also need to need to contribute. So.、Uh, Uh, yes, so、uh, I have to strike a good balance, but I'm still struggling. I have to say. Yeah, it's hard, especially for your job because <laughs> your clients and your headquarters are all in different time zones, right?、Mm -hmm. So right, right, yeah. You must yeah. have a really chaotic time schedule, right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Our headquarters are in Geneva. Geneva, it's not too bad. They open、uh, around three to four p.m. Japan time, so we usually have an online meeting、uh, late afternoon. However,、uh, we have clients、uh, and colleagues in the U.S.、Uh, and Pacific、uh, West Coast, and、uh, when we have to talk with. People on the west coast and people in Geneva simultaneously, then it becomes very difficult.、Uh, recently, I had a conference call which started at 11 p.m. Japan time and ended 1 a.m. Japan time. That was really a night, really difficult. Wow! <laughs>、so. I wouldn't. I would be so sleepy or then so、mm. awake and then unable to sleep after. So difficult <laughs> challenge, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Internet is great.、Uh, we can we can meet online, but you know, time difference still exists. Yeah,、mm. for sure. Do、mm. you have any anything you foresee, like any targets for the upcoming year, or are you still trying to work out what's happening with coronavirus and wait and see approach? Right, right.、Uh, well, I mean,、uh, we are、uh, trying to think、uh, for the next three years. Uh, and for two, 2020 and early 2021,、uh, I think we will be affected, continue to be affected by the pandemic.、Uh, so、uh, we are quickly shifting to new modality that is feasible in this、uh, pandemic time. But、uh, hopefully, hopefully, it really depends on how quickly we get,、uh, you know,、um, uh, medical. Uh, treatment and also vaccination become available. Hopefully, it becomes available very soon.、Uh, when that happens and when we can、uh, travel safely once again,、uh, then we will、uh, start introducing back face-to-face、uh, -face workshops as well. So、uh, online and face-to-face. Uh, and um, but uh, we are not going back to. Uh, the old normal normality.、Uh, we are moving to the new normality, uh, and um, so uh, we will、uh, continue to take advantage of new technologies. And also, the pandemic has revealed current issues、uh, of the modern society. You know, this inequality issue:、uh, people who have been left behind. People who do not have access to internet, how to reach out to them, how to support them is going to be an important topic for us. Climate issue.、Uh, this is、uh, a crisis of our generation, so、uh, we really have to take actions.、Uh, so, and also, you know, peace issue,、uh, and also, you know, increasing. Tensions we are seeing、uh, between countries, and、um, you know,、um, for the UN and also I myself personally, you know, working in isolation is never a solution.、Uh, working together, you know, people from different background come together, and that's when innovation can happen. So、uh, we, I really want to、uh, foster. That environment, and I, you know, I'm really trying、uh, so that Unita can help create that kind of environment. So、uh, it's going to be a challenging time for Unita and everyone、um, for the immediate future. But、uh, I'm very optimistic. In the mid and long term, we learn important lessons, and we will use it and create a better world. Wonderful! What a fantastic way to end. 
Thank you so much for joining today and for all your insights. And I really appreciate all the work that you and the UNITAR team is doing in Hiroshima and around the world. So thank you so much and please keep up the good work, but also please have a balance and take care of yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and a great honor to be the 60th person in Fantastic. this series. Fantastic. Yeah, really. So, uh, thank you so much. Wonderful. And thank you everybody for joining and watching today. Um, we have another talk tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. with Richard Graham, who is a media expert helping promote sustainable brands. So please join us tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Everyone, please take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.